So hello everyone and welcome to the second Brody Forum of this academic year. My name is Clara Haas and I am this year's Brody Scholar. I want to inform all attendees that this event will be recorded and in fact is being recorded. Um, questions for our speaker can be dropped in the chat. We'll do our best to address those during the Q&A session toward the end of the program. So with that housekeeping out of the way, I would like to thank the Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation and the Brody family for their support of Brody initiatives at the school. Norman Florence Brody established the Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation Public Policy Forum in 1996. Multiple forums are held annually at the university and in Washington, DC, with a focus on public policy issues in the United States. Similarly, I would like to thank Dr. Betty Duke, the Brody Professor, for the invaluable role she plays in planning and executing these events, Dean Robert Orr for his support of the Brody Program, and Martin Sanders, a member of the Brody Student Advisory Council, who will moderate today's Q&A. This fall, the Brody Forum topics aim to cover a trifecta of issues critical to our school, communities, and country. Racism, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the US presidential election. An October 21 forum featured a moderated discussion between Dean Robert Orr and Nikidra or Nike Robinson, founder and CEO of Black Girls Vote. Today's November 11th forum features a presentation and Q&A by Richard Rothstein. Richard is a distinguished fellow of the Economic Policy Institute and a senior fellow emeritus at the Thurgood Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He's the author of The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, which recovers a forgotten history of how federal, state, and local policy explicitly segregated metropolitan areas nationwide, creating racially homogenous neighborhoods in patterns that violate the Constitution and require remediation. He's also the author of many other articles and books on race and education, which can be found on his webpage at the Economic Policy Institute. Richard, welcome to the School of Public Policy. Thank you for taking the time to address our campus community today. And without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to you for your remarks. Thank you very much, Claire. Thanks to all of you for coming today to engage with me in this discussion. Uh, let me begin by reminding all of us that in the 20th century, we had a civil rights movement in this country. It began by challenging segregation in law schools, colleges, and universities. And then, as you know, in 1954, succeeded in getting a Supreme Court decision that prohibited legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. And that Brown decision gave impetus, stimulus, inspiration, to a civil rights movement of activists, uh, marches, demonstrations, civil disobedience. Some people lost their lives in that struggle. Uh, but by the end of the 1960s, the civil rights movement of that era <clears throat> pretty much persuaded most people in the country that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both blacks and whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy, and with that understanding and with its very activist uh, demonstrations and marches, civil disobedience, it succeeded in ending segregation in uh, buses and lunch counters and public accommodations of all kinds and interstate transportation uh, in uh, voting and uh, um, in, in employment. And um, yet, uh, by at the end of the 1960s, uh, the civil rights movement pretty much ended, went home, left untouched the biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. Uh, I've lived in many of them. Uh, perhaps you've lived in others. Uh, every one that I've lived in had clearly defined areas that were all white or mostly white, clearly defined areas that were all black or mostly black. I mean, how could it be? We came to an understanding that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both blacks and to whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy. How could we have left untouched the biggest segregation of all? We're an apartheid society. 
Well, partly, I guess it's because it's hard to undo residential segregation. If we abolish segregation in restaurants, next day you sit from any restaurant in any restaurant you want. Uh, but if we abolish segregation in neighborhoods, the next things that they things wouldn't look much different. Uh, and so what we've done, all of us, and I mean all of us, uh, blacks and whites, northerners, southerners, liberals, conservatives, is we've adopted a national rationalization, an excuse we give ourselves to avoid confronting, redressing this biggest segregation of all. And the excuse goes something like this. We tell ourselves that the segregation of buses and restaurants and colleges and universities, schools, that was all done by government. If, if it was a law or regulation, if the federal government was doing it, it was a violation of the Fifth Amendment and a civil rights violation. And we understand that if the federal government is violating civil rights, we have to do something to end it, to fix it. If the state and local government was doing it, it was a violation of the 14th Amendment, also a civil rights violation, uh, something that would require as American citizens to redress. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves that's something entirely different. That wasn't done by <clears throat> government. That wasn't done by law, or regulation, or ordinance, uh, public policy of any kind. That just sort of happened naturally by accident. We're residentially segregated because white homeowners and uh, landlords of private citizens refuse to sell or rent to African-Americans in white neighborhoods or maybe because uh, private businesses like banks or real estate agencies, uh, not government, uh, discriminated in how they uh, handled uh, the sale and rental of property. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's just because blacks and whites, we like to live with each other of the same race. We feel more comfortable that way. Uh, and that's why we have residential segregation. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's all income differences. Uh, on average, African-Americans have lower incomes than whites and so uh, can't uh, frequently afford to live in more expensive white middle-class neighborhoods. All of these individual bigoted, but uh, private decisions, actors in the private economy, self-choice, economic differences is what's created residential segregation. And we tell ourselves if it happened by naturally, if it happened by accident, it can only unhappen naturally. It can only unhappen by accident. We may think it's too bad. We may not like living in an apartheid society, but we don't feel any obligation as American citizens to do anything about it. It's not a civil rights violation. Well, as Claire mentioned when she introduced me, I spent much of my time writing about education policy. I became convinced in the 1990s and 2000s that the education policy we were following in this country made no sense. Uh, we were telling ourselves in the 1990s and early 2000s that the reason there was an achievement gap between black and white children, the reason that black children on average had lower academic outcomes than white children uh, was because teachers were bigoted. Teachers uh, had low expectations of black children. They didn't try very hard. And we told ourselves that if only we could force teachers to um, try harder, the achievement gap between black and white children would disappear. I consider this a, a ludicrous theory, uh, to put it mildly, and I spent much of the 1990s and 2000s writing articles and papers uh, demonstrating why I thought it was ludicrous. Uh, I remember writing one column um, in the New York Times talking about asthma. Uh, as you may know, African-American children in urban neighborhoods have asthma at four times the rate of middle-class children in suburban neighborhoods. Four times the rate. It's a phenomenal difference. And the reason African-American children have, have asthma at such a high rate is because they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more diesel trucks driving through, more dilapidated buildings, more vermin in the environment, more empty lots kicking up dust. Um, and if your child has asthma, that child is more likely than a child without asthma. It's not true of every child, but more likely than a child without asthma to be up at night wheezing. Uh, coming to school the next day drowsy, sleepless. And if you have two groups of children who are identical in every respect, same racial breakdown, same social and economic background, same family structure, the same economic situation, but one group has a higher rate of asthma than the other, that group's going to have lower average achievement. 
simply from being sleepier than the group that doesn't have asthma. It's not a big difference, but then you begin to think of all of the conditions that add one after another to these uh, impediments to learning, whether it's asthma or lead poisoning that has a, a, a concrete uh, uh, impact on IQ or homelessness or economic insecurity. When you've added all these up, you've pretty much explained the achievement gap. It's not that there aren't some teachers who have low expectations and are bigoted, but that's not the main reason why we have an achievement gap. Then I began to realize this one thing, if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness, what happens if you have a school where every child has one or more of these conditions, one of these more, more of these challenges? How can such a school ever be expected to have the same achievement as a school where children come to school, healthy, well-rested, in economically secure homes? You can't have that expectation. I guess you can, you can pass a law requiring it to happen but it's magical thinking. And of course, the No Child Left Behind law that we passed in 2001 that said that if you test children all the time and hold teachers accountable for the test scores, the achievement gap will disappear. It turned out to be an utter failure. Didn't, didn't close the achievement gap. All it did was uh, give schools an incentive to drop a well-rounded curriculum and spend most of their time drilling children in math and reading to try to, in a fruitless attempt, to uh, eliminate all these influences that I described that uh, lower their test scores. Well, we call schools where you concentrate children with these kinds of disadvantages, we call them segregated schools. And schools today are more segregated than they have been at any time in the last 45 years. So I began to think that, um, that segregation was a problem that I needed to focus on. And I realized that the schools are segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So neighborhood segregation must be an educational problem. That's how I came to start thinking about this topic. And then in 2007, I read a Supreme Court decision. That decision um, evaluated a, a program of two school districts, so Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Kentucky. Both of those school districts had a very trivial uh, school desegregation plan. They gave parents the choice of which school in the district their child would attend. But if that uh, choice was going to exacerbate segregation, it wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a child who wouldn't. So if you had an all white or mostly white school and both a black and a white child applied for the last remaining place in that school, the black child would be given some preference. Very trivial program and you don't have one place left and uh, two children, one black and one white, applying for it very often. But the Supreme Court evaluated this program. As I say, it took place in Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Kentucky. It denounced it. The controlling opinion was written by Chief Justice John Roberts. He said, you couldn't do such a thing. He said, it's true. The schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated. But he said they're segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. It was a wise observation on the Chief Justice's part. But he said the neighborhoods are in Louisville and Seattle are segregated, and he gave a name to this. He said it de facto because of the bigotry of homeowners or landlords or businesses in the private economy like banks or realtors or insurance companies or people liking to live with each other of the same race or income differences. And he said, where you have de facto segregation, something that wasn't done by government. It's not a civil rights violation. And if government didn't do it, government is prohibited from doing something to undo it. Well, I read this decision and I remembered something that happened some years before in one of the cities that was involved, Louisville, Kentucky. In Louisville, there was a white homeowner in a single family home in an all white suburb outside Louisville called Shively. That white homeowner had an African-American friend living in the center city of Louisville. That friend was an, a decorated Navy veteran, had a wife and a child, uh, wanted to move to a single family home, but nobody would sell him one. So the white homeowner in this all uh, white suburb called Shively bought a second home in his community and resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American friend moved in, an angry mob surrounded the home of white neighbors. The mob was protected by the police they threw rocks through the windows. The police made no effort to stop it. They dynamited and firebombed the home. The police made no effort to stop it. 
But when this riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence the white homeowner for sedition, for having provoked a riot by selling a home in a white neighborhood to a black family. I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police, the criminal justice system, the prosecutors are all lined up uh, in an effort to maintain the racial boundaries of Louisville. I began to look into it further and I found that this was not an unusual uh, circumstance. There were hundreds and hundreds of cases in Baltimore, uh, in Washington, in New York, Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, Kansas City, of mob violence protected by the police, driving African Americans out of homes that they had legitimately rented or purchased in previously all white neighborhoods. Every one of these cases where the police were involved and frequently the police organized or led this mob violence was a civil rights violation, a violation of our constitution. Uh, it gives the lie to the notion of de facto segregation. It's a civil rights violation. It, what They were civil rights violations that we have an obligation as American citizens to remedy. And we've never accepted that obligation. And then I began to look into it further and I discovered that it wasn't just police protected violence that violated the 14th Amendment that uh, created segregation that we know today. But there were many, many racially explicit federal, state, and local policies that were designed to ensure that African-Americans and whites could not live near one another in any metropolitan area of this country. Uh, that the system of these policies and practices was so widespread, so interlocking, that the whole notion of de facto segregation makes no sense. Uh, we have an unconstitutional system of residential segregation that we as American citizens have an obligation to remedy. Well, in the few minutes that I have uh, with you uh, this morning, uh, before we get to the Q&A, let me describe a couple of the main federal policies that were practiced by our federal government to create, maintain, and reinforce racial segregation. Perhaps the best known of them, um, or the most powerful of them, is a program uh, on which the federal government embarked after World War II to suburbanize the entire white working class population of this country into single family homes in all white suburbs like that one I described outside Louisville, Shively. Uh, it was an explicit racial program. At the time, after World War II, where there were millions of returning war veterans, uh, whites as well as African-Americans were living in urban areas, downtown areas, frequently integrated communities uh, for the simple reason that we were a manufacturing economy and um, uh, factories had to be located near deep water ports and railroad terminals to get their parts or ship their final products. Uh, the workers in these factories, uh, as well as the workers in the banks that service them and the other service industries, uh, didn't have cars, they had to walk to work, they had to live close enough to the downtown manufacturing district to be able to walk to work or take short streetcar rides uh, to get there. So many of these neighborhoods were integrated, but the federal government had a program to move the whites out of those neighborhoods and turn them into all black communities. Uh, the suburbanization of the country took place under this racially explicit program. And I'm sure you've heard of many of these suburbs, but they exist in every metropolitan area of this country. They exist around Washington, around Baltimore, East Coast, West Coast, uh, North, South, Midwest. The most famous of them is Levittown, uh, east of New York City. Perhaps you've heard of that. Uh, there were other Levittowns built afterwards as well, similar subdivisions. Uh, Levittown, a modest uh, uh, community for returning war veterans. The builder, uh, William Levitt, could never have assembled the capital on his own to build 17,000 homes in one place east of New York City. It was an enormous uh, undertaking. Uh, no bank would be crazy enough to lend him the money to buy the land and build these uh, homes. Uh, we weren't a suburban country at this time. Uh, the banks thought this was a crazy idea, building single family home suburbs. Nobody was going to move to these places, would want to move to these places, the banks thought. Uh, the only way Levitt could get the capital to buy the land and build a community of 17,000 homes was by going to the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration, 
submitting us plans for the development, the design of the streets, the layout, the uh, architectural design of the homes, the building materials he's going to use, and a required commitment of the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration that he never sell a home to an African-American. It was an explicit requirement. Uh, the FHA and VA even required Levitt and builders all over the country, in your community and everywhere else, required them to place clauses in the deeds of these homes prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. And those clauses, clauses still exist today. If you live in a home that was built in the post-war period, uh, look at your deed. You'll see that it prohibits uh, occupancy by anyone not of the Caucasian race. Uh, this was not the action. This requirement was not the action of rogue bureaucrats working at the FHA or VA. It was an explicit written policy of the federal government. Uh, the Fe Federal Housing Administration had an underwriter's manual that was uh, distributed to appraisers all over the country whose job it was to evaluate the application of builders like Levitt to build uh, either small projects or giant ones like his uh, and get federal bank guarantees for their loans to do so. Uh, the manual said explicitly that you couldn't approve for a federal bank guarantee a loan to a builder who was going to sell to African-Americans. Uh, the manual went so far as to say you couldn't even uh, uh, recommend for a federal bank guarantee a loan to a developer who was going to build an all-white project if it was going to be located near where African-Americans were living. Because in the words of the federal policy manual, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. This notion of de facto segregation, as I say, is other nonsense. Uh, this is how the country was suburbanized. This is how we created an all white noose around every metropolitan area in this country. Well, Levitt got his loan. He built his development and so did uh, developers all over the country. I, I, in my book, The Color of Law, I have a photograph of a six foot high, half mile long concrete wall that a builder in Detroit was required by the Federal Housing Administration to construct in order to get a bank guarantee for his loans uh, because his development was going to be located near where African-Americans were living. And this half mile long, six foot high concrete wall uh, was going to keep blacks from walking into their neighborhood. Well, <clears throat> the homes were inexpensive. As I say, they were mostly for returning war veterans. Uh, they sold uh, at the time for about eight, nine thousand dollars a piece in various parts of the country, never much more than that, sometimes ten thousand uh, dollars. In today's money, uh, inflation adjusted, that's about a hundred thousand dollars. So these were modest, modest homes. Any worker, uh, any working class family, black or white, uh, could return, could, could um, er, uh, afford to uh, uh, buy a, a home for a hundred thousand uh, dollars. If uh, it was a returning war veteran, again, black or white, uh, no down payment was required, except that Blacks were prohibited from participating in this program. Well, as you all know, these suburban homes in every metropolitan area in this country no longer sell for $100,000. Uh, you can't buy one for $100,000. Uh, they cost uh, $300,000, $400,000, $500,000 in some parts of the country, a million dollars or more. The white families who were subsidized by Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration mortgages uh, and the builders of their developments uh, subsidized by uh, federal bank guarantees. The white families gained wealth from the appreciation and the value of their homes, equity. Most of the families in this country who have any wealth get it from the equity they have in their homes. Uh, the white families use that wealth to send their children to college. They used it to uh, take care of perhaps temporary emergencies or maybe medical, maybe temporary unemployment. You know, if you have equity in your home, you have wealth and you lose a job, you can weather temporary unemployment. You can uh, dip into it. You can uh, refinance your home. If you don't have wealth and you lose a job, you're pushed further down the economic scale permanently. Uh, the white families also use this wealth that they gain from their equity to um, finance their retirements. And they use it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren, who then had uh, down payments for their own homes. Uh, African-Americans are prohibited, prohibited from participating in this wealth generating exercise. Uh, 
The result is, of course, we have a, a white noose around every metropolitan area of this country, African-Americans remaining in urban areas uh, with um, uh, inability to have down payments to move into these neighborhoods, even if they hadn't appreciated the value. Uh, the result is that today, uh, on average, African-American incomes are about 60%. Uh, 60 percent of, of white incomes. There's a whole story behind that too. Uh, I don't have time to go into to it today, but it was also largely unconstitutionally created uh, by uh, uh, federal policy. But you'd think if there was a 60 percent income ratio, there'd be a 60 percent wealth ratio as well. But um, that uh, uh, that's not the case. Uh, African American wealth is not 60% of white wealth on average. African-American household wealth is about 5% of white wealth. And that enormous disparity between the 60% income ratio and the 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy. There was practice in the mid 20th century that every one of us as an American citizen, as a citizen has an obligation to remedy and that we've never undertaken uh, that obligation. Well, um, that wealth gap um, and the concentration of African-Americans and uh, that still exists today in large part because of the uh, income differences and wealth gaps that were created in the 20th century predicts many of the social problems that we have in this country today. Uh, I mentioned there earlier the, the problems that public schools face with an achievement gap between black and white children. It uh, uh, determines to a large extent health disparities between blacks and whites. African-Americans have shorter life expectancies, greater rates of cardiovascular disease, in large part because they live in more polluted, uh, more dangerous neighborhoods, uh, less access to grocery stores that sell fresh food. It predicts the mass incarceration uh, that we uh, are so aware of now and the police abuse of African-Americans in a discriminatory fashion. Uh, I wouldn't... Uh, suggest for a minute that there would never be any police abuse of African-Americans if it weren't for segregation, but segregation certainly makes it much, much more intense and, and um, uh, frequent than it would otherwise be. Uh, when you concentrate the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods uh, without access to good jobs or the transportation to get to those jobs or um, opportunities to attend schools with high achieving students, uh, when you do have that concentration, it's inevitable that the police are gonna be engaged in confrontations with them, that the police are going to behave like an occupying force in neighborhoods like that, in the same way that the colonial forces, uh, police forces behaved in places like India and the Congo and throughout the colonial world in the 20th century. Uh, that's an inevitable result of the concentration of a disadvantaged minority population in a single area. And the, the wealth gap that we created uh, by our federal policy also um, determines something else that I think is very, very dangerous and frightening uh, today. Um, it's the, the uh, very extreme political polarization that we're very much aware of this week. And uh, in particular, the extreme political polarization that we have in this country today that largely tracks racial lines. It's not entirely racial, uh, but it largely tracks racial lines how can we ever expect to develop the common national identity that we need to preserve this democracy if so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other that we have no ability to empathize with each other and no ability to understand each other's life experiences? No ability, as I say, to develop a common national identity. So those are the consequences of the unconstitutional policies that we practiced in the mid 20th century and that we've never remedied. There are many, many other policies I could discuss, and perhaps in the q and I, I will have the opportunity to do so. But let me just say that the, the, the policies to remedy racial segregation, residential segregation are well known. There is no mystery about it, none whatsoever. Uh, policymakers, uh, housing experts, think tanks, or uh, journalists like me spin out uh, uh, articles all the time. Uh, explaining what we could do to redress racial segregation. The problem is not policy ideas. The problem is the lack of a new civil rights movement today that's going to engage in the kind of uh, direct action, militant action uh, 
to uh, insist and make it uncomfortable for this country to uh, maintain the segregated patterns that we have. I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes to mention a few policies to give you an example of how easy it is to design policies to redress segregation. Um, take the example I gave before of the creation of these suburbs. Uh, they sold initially for $100,000 when African-Americans could have moved into them. They now sell for $500,000 where uh, working class families of either race, especially if they don't have down payments, cannot possibly afford to live there. Well, that's a, that was an unconstitutionally created inequality. Uh, the federal government has a constitutional obligation to remedy it. An affirmative action program in housing would have the federal government buying up homes in these suburban communities at market rates and reselling them to African-Americans at deeply discounted rates uh, to uh, enable them to live in places from which they were unconstitutionally excluded. That would be a narrowly targeted remedy for a very explicit constitutional violation. In light of this history, uh, there is no basis for being opposed to it. Uh, but of course, uh, there's no political support for doing that. Uh, we have programs that um, uh, segregate, that continue to segregate low-income families. The biggest subsidy we have for um, low-income, uh, disproportionately African-American and Hispanic families is the uh, low-income housing tax credit. It's run by the Treasury Department. It's uh, a subsidy for, that's given to states who then distribute them to developers to build uh, housing for low-income families. Uh, it disproportionately places low-income housing tax credit units in existing low-income segregated neighborhoods. The Treasury Department regulations actually require a priority be placed to putting low-income housing tax credit units in existing low-income neighborhoods. That's crazy. It should be the reverse. Not that we shouldn't put better housing in those neighborhoods, but um, we certainly shouldn't do it disproportionately so. Um, that reinforces segregation. But we can't place those... Uh, projects in the uh, uh, higher opportunity communities for the most part because there are zoning laws that prohibit uh, the construction of uh, even townhouses, garden apartments, and certainly low-income units in many all-white all suburban communities. Uh, uh, landlords won't uh, permit uh, 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 low-income families to move to those communities even if it weren't for those zoning ordinances. So, um, uh, we maintain policies that reinforce segregation. What's needed, as I said, is a new civil rights movement that's going to make it uncomfortable not to implement policies to redress segregation. Uh, let me conclude by saying that I am working with a group of national civil rights leaders to create a new national committee to redress racial segregation uh, in, in, in neighborhoods. Uh, we were about to launch it actually uh, uh, be just prior to the pandemic. Uh, our focus is on creating local civil rights groups. And so we put it on pause until it's possible again to organize local committees to take this kind of action. Uh, but um, if any of you are interested in uh, being on the mailing list to receive the announcement of this new national committee uh, to redress racial segregation, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Claire or, or Martin or one of you can figure out a way of assembling a list and I'd be glad to add them. Uh, to uh, uh, the announcement list of the National Committee to Redress Racial Segregation. Well, I want to thank you for your attention. And uh, Martin, I understand you might have a question or two you want to ask. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Richard. This is, um, I mean, that, that was a truly amazing presentation. and uh, uh, A good summary in addition to uh, what you wrote in your book. And uh, I just want to say that uh, for me, this this book, The Color of Law, was my impetus into getting into policy school. Um, I was a public school teacher in the Bronx, and much like you, education, I thought about, you know, how in this singular building, you know, what can we do here to fix this, or what do we need to ask, to ask policy uh, makers to fix the education system? But upon reading your book, I realized there's this whole broader array of policy initiatives, particularly with housing, um, that would directly affect uh, my students' ability to learn. So um, this is a bit of a fanboy moment for me. <laughs> um, so uh, my, my first question for you is, you talked a little bit about um, public housing in America, but I was just wondering if you can go back to kind of talking about how 
public housing has transformed over time. Because in your book, you 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 talked about the evolution of public housing. So just wondering if you can end on that a little bit. Sure. This is another whole policy area, another area in which the federal government created segregation. There was never any public housing in this country prior to the New Deal, uh, prior to the Depression uh, in the 1930s. Uh, the very first civilian public housing in this country was built uh, by the Roosevelt administration during the Depression. The first agency to uh, build public housing was the Public Works Administration. It was one of the first uh, New Deal agencies to fight the Depression. Uh, the Public Works Administration created uh, projects uh, around the country um, for working class, lower middle class families. It was not for poor people. We completely misunderstand what public housing is today or has to be in this country. Public housing uh, was not created for poor people. It was uh, created for working class families. We had a 25% unemployment rate in the depression, enormous amount of unemployment. But public housing was for the 75% who had good stable jobs. Couldn't get into public housing without a good solid work record and an assured income because it wasn't subsidized. The federal government built it, but uh, uh, it, uh, you had to pay the full cost of the housing and your rent. Uh, it was being built not for not as a welfare program for low-income families. It was being built because there was very little private activity going on, economic activity. Housing wasn't being built, so there was a housing shortage, and many of these employed workers couldn't find housing. Well, the Public Works Administration built this housing, and everywhere it built it, it segregated it. You recall, I, I mentioned in my talk that many of these uh, urban neighborhoods, uh, downtown neighborhoods, were not segregated in the early mid 20th century, um, simply because workers had to live close enough to where they work. But the Public Works Administration went into these neighborhoods and began segregating them with public housing projects. Uh, the great African American poet, novelist, playwright Langston Hughes, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. If not, you should be. Uh, but uh, he wrote in his autobiography that he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. It's not how we think of downtown Cleveland today. He said in high school, his best friend was Polish. He said he dated a Jewish girl in high school. Well, of course, we you'd expect that kind of thing to be happening if you would go to an integrated high school in an integrated neighborhood. The Public Works Administration went into that neighborhood in Cleveland, an integrated neighborhood, and built two separate projects, one for whites, one for African-Americans creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed. Uh, in my book, uh, uh, The Color of Law, I, I like to, where I can, uh, pick on self-satisfied smug places that think they're better than others. Uh, one of them I describe as a place maybe you've heard of, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, the area between Harvard and MIT uh, in the 1930s was a, a fully integrated neighborhood called the Central Square neighborhood. Uh, the Public Works Administration went into that neighborhood and the federal government built two separate projects, one for whites, one for African-Americans, creating a pattern of segregation there and with other similar projects elsewhere in the Boston area, a pattern of segregation that still exists today. During World War II, hundreds of thousands of workers flocked to centers of war production to take jobs in war industries, jobs that were scarce uh, prior to uh, the war. They overwhelmed the communities where these war plants were, were um, uh, uh, operating. Uh, and if the federal government wanted the planes and the jeeps and the tanks and the airplanes and the ships to be produced, it had to find housing for these workers. And it did. Everywhere where there's a war plant, the federal government built housing for war workers on a segregated basis for workers who were working in the same uh, war plants, uh, creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed frequently. Um, a good example of that is the West Coast. Uh, there were very few African Americans living on the West Coast uh, prior to World War II. Uh, the, the great migration of African Americans came to uh, out of the former slaveholding states, came to the Northeast and the Midwest uh, after World War I, but it didn't begin until World War II on the West Coast. So there were very few African Americans living there before the war. Uh, but they overwhelmed, uh, along with whites, uh, war workers uh, coming to the West Coast, uh, mostly in shipyards and um, airplane factories. Uh, in San Francisco, for example, the federal government built five projects, uh, housing projects for war workers. Uh, four were for whites only. One was for African-Americans placed in the neighborhood that then became the African-American neighborhood of San Francisco. And the same policy was followed in the um, 
uh, Seattle and Portland and, and Los Angeles up and down the West Coast. That's why we have segregation on the West Coast today. Uh, so um, public housing was another important racially explicit program that um, uh, the federal government followed to create segregation to ensure that blacks and whites could not live next to each other. Yeah, you, in your, your book, The Color of Law, you lay out this really uh, compelling story about on the West Coast, how uh, a black family, a black man who was working at the, uh, the plant had to drive that essentially had to carpool like almost 100 miles, I think it was or so, uh, to the plant where the white families or the white men that were working at the plants, you know, they kind of lived essentially down the street. Um, I want to go next to a few of the questions uh, that were submitted early talked about uh, what can state and local governments do? And I know you've talked about the, the federal government and what it can do. Uh, is this something that state and local governments can can address, or is this something solely that the federal government uh, needs to remedy? No, it's certainly something that the state and lo local governments have a lot uh, that they can do. I, I referred to uh, a few minutes ago um, zoning laws that uh, reinforce racial segregation. Uh, there are many of these all white communities that were created uh, on an all white basis that then uh, reinforced and um, uh, perpetuated this segregation by adoption of zoning rules that prohibit the construction of uh, anything but single family homes frequently on large lot sizes. In my judgment, uh, those uh, zoning rules are unconstitutional uh, because they uh, reinforce a unconstitutionally created segregation, but states can prohibit local communities from uh, adopting zoning rules like that. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't have any zoning. Uh, uh, certainly we should prohibit industrial facilities from being located in residential areas, but there's absolutely no principled basis for having communities where you cannot have townhouses or garden apartments or um, even uh, apartment buildings. Uh, I'm not talking about high rises, but uh, multifamily units, uh, all of which are the absence of all of which uh, preserve um, segregation. So that's one big policy that uh, the federal, that I'm sorry, that state governments and local governments uh, can implement. Um, another is, and uh, frankly, uh, uh, this is a, 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 the financial obligation to fix this is not entirely the federal governments. It's uh, state and local governments as well. State and local governments that participated in the creation of this segregation along with the federal government. I didn't uh, have time to talk about state policies uh, earlier, but the states are equally culpable, have an obligation to redress it. Uh, states and local governments should be um, establishing uh, assistance funds, down payment assistance funds, uh, to permit uh, African Americans to um, move to communities where uh, they previously, where they presently can't afford to because they have no wealth that's comparable to white wealth. Uh, it should be doing the same kind of thing that I talked about the federal government doing. It should be buying up homes and reselling them to African-Americans that were uh, excluded. Um, that's another uh, policy they should follow. A big policy that the, the federal, that state, I'm sorry, that state government should implement is much more rigorous uh, uh, enforcement of the Fair Housing Act that we adopted in 1968 that doesn't fix the segregation that we created. It prohibited ongoing discrimination in the sale and rental of housing, but that doesn't deal with the uh, segregation that was already created and the wealth gap that results from it. And um, state uh, governments license real estate agents. Every real estate agent in this country is licensed by a state government agency. Uh, state governments do very little to enforce the Fair Housing Act. Uh, they don't remove uh, uh, real estate agents that uh, steer families who are white to white neighborhoods and steer families that are black to black neighborhoods. State governments should be auditing the performance of real estate agents in their, in their states and identifying those who uh, uh, steer families to same race neighborhoods. Uh, the federal government has periodically conducted uh, what we call audit studies where they send uh, uh, identical uh, uh, African-Americans and whites with identical financial histories, identical uh, job histories, uh, identical work histories uh, to um, uh, try to uh, purchase a home. And um, the federal government documents all the time that um, there's discrimination that still exists despite the Fair Housing Act. 
in how real estate agents treat identical black and white buyers, but the federal government doesn't uh, identify uh, the perpetrators of this discrimination. It just produces statistics showing that discrimination exists. State governments should be identifying them by conducting its own audit studies to um, uh, identify perpetrators and to deny licenses and license renewals to real estate agents. And the same thing is true of landlords. There can be much better enforcement of non-discrimination laws against landlords. Uh, some states, um, uh, a very few, uh, have um, provisions that uh, prohibit discrimination against Section 8 voucher holders, uh, uh, disproportionately uh, African-American and Hispanic. Uh, uh, most, in most of the country, uh, uh, discrimination against Section 8 voucher holders is perfectly legal. A landlord can refuse to rent to somebody simply because uh, that family uh, or person has a, a, a voucher that helps to pay their rent. Um, that kind of discrimination should be prohibited. And uh, there's a small number of states and, and um, uh, uh, federal uh, uh, states and localities that have prohibited such discrimination. Everyone should do so. I think I'm not sure about this. I think perhaps Baltimore prohibits, um, the city of Baltimore prohibits uh, that kind of discrimination, but I don't believe that Baltimore County does so. Uh, so um, that's a, a step that can be taken locally uh, for you uh, uh, right now. So, uh, yeah, there, and there are many, many other policies I can go into that uh, state and localities could um, engage in to redress segregation. So I, I think it's really interesting that kind of the, the underlying of what you were saying was accountability. States, federal government, localities need to hold people accountable. And that, I think that's a good segue into Dean Orr's question and a question that other people had as well is uh, with the incoming uh, administration, uh, Joe Biden during former president, uh, Biden on the campaign trail, now president-elect, um, talked a lot about um, closing the wealth gap, and primarily he talked about through black home ownership. Uh, so uh, the question is, what can this administration accomplish in four years on housing policy um, in regards to the black community? And if you had a magic, if you had the ability to um, uh, predict who should be the HUD secretary, um, who would you like to see? I'm going to have an answer that surprises you. I really don't care. I don't think it makes much difference. As I said in my talk, until there's a civil rights movement that creates the political pressure to redress the segregation we've created, uh, there's very little that the federal government, even uh, under a sympathetic administration, is going to be able to accomplish. Um, you know, uh, even uh, the Trump administration, um, uh, came into office, you know, Secretary of uh, Housing and Urban Development, uh, Ben Carson, said that he was going to um, take action to force uh, the suburban communities to repeal exclusionary zoning ordinances. Uh, does that surprise you? Well, it's a libertarian um, uh, program. They don't believe in regulation. He said, you shouldn't be able to have a regulation that prevents a property owner from uh, building a townhouse or well, he dropped that pretty quickly. Uh, that was, uh, you didn't hear much of it um, after he took office. Uh, and you wouldn't hear much of it after a, a, a Democratic um, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development uh, took office either. You know, the Democratic Party, let me say, is a, um, it's a complex party. It, it consists of both, and you know this from the recent election, how tight it was and how many different constituencies it had to, uh, 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 mobilize in order to uh, win uh, the presidency, but it consists of uh, low-income, uh, minority African-American voters in particular, and Hispanics to a somewhat lesser extent, but also overwhelmingly so, uh, as well as uh, white suburbanites. Uh, we call them uh, NIMBYs, not in my backyard. And uh, the same white suburbanites who helped elect uh, uh, Biden president will be a uh, important sources of resistance to uh, the abolition of exclusionary zoning ordinances, for example. So we need a political movement. These policies don't come from the heads of, uh, of, of uh, public officials. They come in response to um, uh, political pressure. The civil rights victories that I began by talking about in the 1960s, 
uh, did not come about because uh, Lyndon Johnson, the president, was uh, in favor of integration. He was. In, in, he was probably the most progressive president we've ever had when it came to race relations. But uh, it came about because uh, uh, John Lewis and other civil rights activists made good trouble, uh, making it impossible for Congress and the president to avoid acting to undo segregation and in the institutions where we did that. So my emphasis is on a new civil rights movement. It's not on who will hold elective office. Uh, I certainly think that um, uh, President-elect uh, Biden and uh, uh, his cabinet will be more receptive to that pressure. But uh, without that pressure to change the political environment, uh, we're not going to accomplish much in the way of residential desegregation. So um, thank you for that. And that's, so I, I guess the, the question, this comes from Alana in the chat and uh, she talks about how there's this lack of awareness um, about the issue of housing segregation in, in America. And we, you know, we all experience it to your point. We, we live in, I've lived in a segregated neighborhood my entire life. I've taught in a segregated neighborhood, even when I'm from Indianapolis, I moved to New York City. I moved to a segregated neighborhood, taught in a segregated neighborhood. I lived in DC in a segregated neighborhood. So it's it's almost seems it seems inescapable um, from my experience. But um, how do we spread the edge? Alana asks, how do we spread the education about these uh, policies um, to help people stop ignoring the issues um, and uh, if we cannot get support for these policies, she says we cannot get support for these policies unless people are educated about this. So how do you see this widespread education taking place? I know you mentioned the civil rights group, but how do you go about implementing that? Well, um, you know, in, in the color of law, as you know, I spend a few pages reporting on the review I did of all of the textbooks that are commonly used in American history uh, courses in high schools all over the country. Every one of them lies about this history. They all promote the myth of de facto segregation. They praise the great work of the New Deal in creating suburban homes for returning war veterans, never mentioning that it was only white returning war veterans who were eligible to uh, occupy these homes. It talks about the great work that the, the early New Deal did in uh, creating a public housing without ever mentioning that it was implemented on a segregated basis. Well, the, the national committee that I mentioned to redress racial segregation has a curriculum unit. Uh, it has a 17-minute video, uh, both for high school uh, teachers and students. Uh, they're free. If you send out a follow-up uh, uh, email to people who registered uh, for this uh, meeting, I can include the links uh, to that uh, um, to those curriculum units and local civil rights groups should uh, investigate how this history as well as the history of slavery and the whole Jim Crow era are being taught in schools and uh, take action to insist that uh, their superintendents, their school board members, their principals uh, ensure that um, it's taught properly because, you know, if the next generation it doesn't learn this history any better than our generation has learned it. They're going to be in this poor position to accept the obligation to remedy it, as our generations have been. So that's one way, uh, I think, that uh, we can uh, widen the understanding of this history. And, and I'll, uh, I'll say just one final thing about it. I guarantee you, if a local civil rights group uh, conducts a campaign to get schools to change the way they're teaching uh, the history of race in this country, uh, that uh, campaign will leak out into the broader adult community and uh, have some impact there as well. True, very true. Um, another question from the chat is from Nathan and he uh, asked if you are familiar with social housing and if you think that can help reduce uh, segregation within states. Well, social housing is a European term that uh, simply refers to the kind of public housing that we had um, in the uh, early 20th century that I referred to before. And that's the, we should have, uh, we should have public housing again. I'm, I'm a big supporter of public housing, not exclusively for poor people. Uh, 
We should have public housing. The government should be building. You talk about what local governments can do. Uh, local governments should be building public housing without federal funds if necessary. And you know the, the enormous increase in property values uh, and in wealth uh, in many of these uh, suburban communities uh, creates um, a funding opportunity for redressing it uh, uh, from tax from property taxation uh, that uh, we should be building public housing that's mixed income that even includes market rate units where families pay the full cost of the housing uh, either in their rent or if they purchase units in public housing as well as units uh, that are affordable for working and middle class families uh, which are who today cannot uh, typically afford uh, uh, market rate units, uh, housing, even in, um, uh, well, particularly in, in gentrifying communities or in, in um, uh, hot, hot, hot uh, housing market uh, urban areas, and as well as um, units for um, uh, deeply subsidized families who have jobs that um, uh, don't pay enough to um, uh, provide housing. So. Yes, we should be building that kind of social housing. Every community, in my judgment, should have a, a mix of um, housing uh, that's market rate, that's uh, mildly subsidized for uh, working and, and middle class families, and that's more heavily subsidized for uh, uh, lower income uh, families, particularly uh, uh, African Americans who, who have been the most affected by the unconstitutional policies that we've created. All right. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. Is that OK? Yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, one question, you mentioned gentrification. And gentrification is so prevalent today in most uh, metropolitan areas. And I was wondering if you could compare uh, the gentrification of today to the explicit residential racial segregation of, of the past. Well, um... I don't know that I would do it that way, um, but I would say that um, the gentrification results from a, uh, a change in, in um, lifestyle preferences, particularly for young professionals who um, themselves, the whites, uh, cannot afford to live in these um, now high value neighborhoods where they grew up, but which their parents and grandparents could afford to live. and. Uh, Gentrification, in my view, is a healthy phenomenon. Every community, as I said, should have a market rate, um, uh, moderate uh, and low income housing options available. Uh, the problem with gentrification is uh, not that it improves the quality of a, a low income neighborhood. The problem with gentrification is it goes so far that it winds up displacing and uh, uh, forcing out the uh, existing um, low income disproportionately uh, African American and in some places Hispanic uh, communities. We know how to prevent that. We know how to control gentrification. We know how to have healthy gentrification, which improves the quality of a neighborhood where um, uh, African Americans live without forcing um, large numbers of them out. The policy we should follow are things like rent control, uh, uh, well-enforced rent control, uh, we should prohibit uh, or limit, not prohibit, but limit condominium conversions in gentrifying neighborhoods. We should require developments um, of new housing in those neighborhoods to have units that are subsidized for low income and moderate income families. And we should freeze property taxes of existing homeowners in those neighborhoods because too many African-American homeowners who purchased uh, homes uh, many, many years ago and may even now have fully paid them off can no longer afford to live in their own homes because as the neighborhoods gentrify, uh, the, um, uh, the property taxes increase to an unaffordable level. So we should implement those kinds of policies. And by the way, uh, 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 school districts we know uh, depend and, and libraries and sometimes fire departments depend on property taxes. Such a policy can be implemented in such a way that doesn't uh, harm those uh, uh, public facilities. The um, uh, lost property taxes from a property tax freeze uh, 
can re be recouped at point of sale. So if you have an African-American homeowner, for example, who um, uh, uh, bought a home, say for $30,000 uh, 30 years ago and pays property taxes under a freeze program at the $30,000 rate and then sells the home for $300,000 in a gentrifying neighborhood, uh, instead of making a $270,000 $270, capital gain from that sale, the homeowner can make only a, a 200,000 capital gain and the 70,000 in lost property taxes at that point gets returned to the treasury. So as I said before, and I'm repeating myself, the policies are well known. Uh, the policy I just mentioned about a property tax freeze has been promoted by uh, uh, the uh, a former uh, commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service as a way of, uh, of restraining gentrification. So the policies are well known What's missing is a new civil rights movement to insist on the implementation of these policies. All right, and to, to close us out, uh, one of the questions from, I believe, Meredith. Um, what can, what are some places people can start to develop their understanding of uh, housing, the history of housing policy, housing policy, uh, what are some books or publications you recommend for people to read um, so they can become somewhat, you know, to, to achieve some level of, of knowledge uh, that you've been able to wonderfully share with us today? Well, of course, you know, my book is a place to start. Um, unfortunately, there are many books written on this topic. Unfortunately, they're all written for academics. And uh, the, the thing that's unique about my book is not that it gives information that wasn't previously known. Uh, the thing that's unique about it is I, I'm a journalist and I wrote it for a popular audience and converted um, well-researched evidence um, uh, for a, a popular audience. But uh, I relied on a lot of good books on this topic. Uh, there's a book by um, uh, uh, Douglas Massey and Nancy Denton called American Apartheid. Uh, which goes into much more technical detail uh, about uh, how this was created. Uh, there's a book by Kenneth Jackson called Crabgrass Frontier, which describes the suburbanization uh, that took place um, uh, in the, the mid 20th century. Uh, those are just a couple, there are many, many others uh, uh, that um, uh, I could name, um, and, uh, but uh, those are two to start with. Right. Well, well, let me mention. I guess, actually, yes. let me mention one other, uh, a recent, sure. a new book, which is also written by a journalist, um, and this is a book uh, about California, uh, but it uh, has relevance around the country. Uh, uh, Connor Doherty, D O U G H E R T Y, published a book earlier this year called "Golden Gates," about this uh, the the NIMBY resistance to efforts to create housing that uh, might be occupied by African-Americans in uh, suburban communities. And if you want a, a journalistic treatment of that particular uh, narrow aspect of the topic, I think Golden Gates would be a good place to, to go. Right, well, Richard, this has been wonderful. Um, and thank you so much, so much great information. And uh, your your candor uh, is, 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 I think, what makes it uh, even more, uh, uh, alive. Uh, I'd like to thank the Brody Forum for hosting us and the School of Public Policy and all of the participants um, for for all your questions and engagement in the chat. I know I missed some of the folks questions, but I hope that I tried to summarize uh, as many of the questions as possible. Um, Claire, do you have any closing remarks? None for me aside from thanks again for to you, Martin for moderating the question and answer session. And thank you again, Richard, for being here with us today. And thank you to all of our attendees. Um, this event again was recorded and will be posted to uh, the UMD Public Policy YouTube channel in the coming days. We will also have an email sent around following the event to all registrants um, with some of the, uh, the resources that Richard mentioned today. So, and, uh, give, give me an hour or two to get you some of the, the these materials before you send out that email. You know. Absolutely. I'm sure folks are eagerly awaiting them, but we will make sure that we have everything together on our end before we before we infiltrate the inboxes of others. Um, so with that, thank you all. Richard, thank you again. Martin, thank you again.
And thank you to everyone for attending this Birdie Forum today. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.